There's a lot of people look at this and they go, oh my goodness, what are we going to do? So let's talk about that for a minute. Well, Mr. Speaker, and uh, to my distinguished colleague from Missouri, thank you so very much uh, for the opportunity to be here. You're, you're exactly right, and you've pointed it out so well. Uh, we have a disease here in Washington, and that disease is, is called overspending. Uh, and it's, by and large, what has brought us economically to where we are today. And the debt that we see is the symptom of that disease. You know, it's amazing to me how many in D.C., how many uh, in the administration and in the previous Congress really believe that we can borrow, tax, and spend our way back to prosperity. You know, as a businessman, uh, as a graduate from a business school, I have a minor in business administration, uh, I don't think that there is a business theory in place that says that you can prosper that way. Uh, well, let it's, me just stop you for, I, I just, just wanted to cut in on you. What you're saying is most businessmen, if you tell them we're having trouble with overspending, so what we're going to do is spend some more, they're going to laugh you out of the shop. Is that basically what it boils down to? Well, that's exactly right. You know, that, that kind of thinking has never been good for families. It's never been good for businesses, and it certainly is not good for America. We see where that has left us, and your charts point out we're on a path to a train wreck here. Yet we see policies consistently coming out of the administration and out of the previous Congress that continue to punish the job creators. Uh, take Ohio, for example. Since the giant stimulus bill was passed um, in the previous uh, session of Congress, only three states have lost more jobs than the state I come from, from the great state of Ohio. Unemployment in the district that I represent is another symptom of that disease. We cannot continue down this track of spending and borrowing and punishing job creators and expect America to pull through this, this economic crisis that we find ourselves in. Say, Bill, uh, if I could, uh, once again, you are right on track and right on topic. This is so important because really down here in Washington, D.C., there are really two very different schools of thought on this, aren't there? I mean, there are some people, and I think there are people probably that come from your background as executives and companies, people who have had the responsibility, you had your own small business, you understand what it takes to make a business work. And the mindset of those people when you get into trouble over spending is you either got to increase your revenue somehow or, or you're going to have to cut back your spending. The, the, but there's a whole other school of thought down here, which to me is kind of weird because I come from the business world too. And the theory is, is that somehow you can get the economy going by spending a ton of money. And that's what that, quote, stimulus bill that we passed uh, two years ago was supposed to create, uh, I don't know how many hundreds of thousands of jobs. And the projections in terms of the number of jobs it was going to produce, it actually lost more than what they projected it was going to do. And at the time, I stood on the floor with a bunch of other people that came from that business background. We're going, hey, this thing isn't going to work. And uh, don't spend this money. And uh, it was sort of based, it was at least theoretically excused under the Keynesian sort of idea that if the government spends a lot of money, it, quote, stimulates the economy and everything will be okay. You know, it's like grabbing your uh, belt loops uh, of your boots and lifting up and flying around the chamber here. It, it's a bizarre idea. And it was tried by that guy, Henry Morgenthau, that worked for FDR. And... Um, they tried it for eight years, spending money like mad, and he appeared before the House Ways and Means Committee, and um, he said, it just doesn't work. Now, that was 1938 that he told Congress, it doesn't work to spend money like that, yet we haven't learned. So that's one possible way that the Democrats propose, and that's spend lots and lots of money, but we see we're spending so much money, the question is, it isn't working because it created unemployment big time. And of course, you in Ohio with your manufacturing background, I mean, we're just killing jobs. And somehow there's this disconnect. You can punish companies, and then you're surprised that there are no jobs. It's sort of bizarre. Uh, I yield again, Bill. Well, 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 thanks. And you hit the nail on the head. 
we're punishing the job creators. You know, I mentioned in Ohio, uh, only three states have lost more jobs since that stimulus bill went into effect. Now, I don't know the exact number today, but uh, on, uh, uh, in November, around election time, Ohio had lost over 400,000 jobs. A lot of those manufacturing, Bill? A absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and, and here's what puzzles me. I, I don't understand why more don't realize that when you let families and businesses keep more of their hard-earned money, that builds economic confidence. That builds uh, buying power. They invest. They spend more. That's what gets an economy going. They begin to, be, uh, to become innovative. Let's, let me give you an example. Uh, Ohio borders uh, on a state that, uh, that has no sales tax on clothing. One of the first things I saw uh, when I started looking at how I could help the state of Ohio was how can we keep that sales tax revenue in the state of Ohio. So we started doing the research. We found out that 17 states have uh, sales tax holiday programs. So I built a grassroots effort to put a sales tax holiday program in place in Ohio. And without going into excruciating detail, that sales tax holiday, having a sales tax holiday around back to school time and a sales tax holiday around Christmas time, promised to bring in upwards of $250 million in additional sales tax revenue into the state coffer, keep retail jobs, let Ohio families keep more of their money. It was amazing what that program would do, yet we could not get uh, those on the other side of the aisle in Ohio to understand that. Uh, and, and to buy into that concept. It's a simple economic concept. So, so just, um, just interrupting again, what you're really saying is that you can get more revenue in a state if you back off on taxes. Absolutely. Now that's an interesting concept. I'd like to pick that theme up because that's something we really need to understand. Uh, you, uh, I assume, were a member of the Ohio legislature at one time. No, no, I was no. not. You were just working the issue and got them to try to the, push I it. built a grassroots effort to try and address that problem. We were successful uh, in, in uh, getting a bill introduced into the, uh, the Ohio state legislature uh, to put those sales tax programs in place, but it, it never made it through the system. Oh, boy. Yeah. Well, we've got another uh, gentleman here uh, going, coming a little farther from the West, uh, Congressman Bishop, who's uh, joining us, also a guy who's uh, had some experience in the business world, but also is a teacher and is a leader here on the floor. He's represented his district, particularly on some armed services kinds of issues, and uh, somebody um, who uh, has really earned the respect of his colleagues and um, has done a great job in setting up some of the new rules that have been established for this Congress. And uh, Congressman Bishop, I'd be uh, delighted to have you join us. You heard what we're talking about. We've got a problem. We're spending too much money. The question is, what are we supposed to do about it? Please. Well, I thank the gentleman from Missouri for allowing uh, me to have some time here. And I appreciate also the gentleman from Ohio's comments uh, illustrating what's happened in the states. Because I think oftentimes we should be looking to the states as an example of what does and what does not work. And we can emulate those concepts here in Washington. You know, you are right as you uh, initially say, we have a severe budget problem. And there are really only two ways of trying to, to reconcile that budget problem. We can either raise taxes or we can cut spending. I think it's interesting to look at what some other states. Cal Thomas had a, a wonderful article this morning. Uh, that, that talked about, maybe it was last night, but he talked about comparing what other states have done. So we see the state of Illinois, another Midwestern state, whose solution to their problem was to raise the personal income tax 67 percent and their corporate tax rates by over 46 percent. Uh, could I interrupt? You said raise the personal income tax in Illinois. Was it by 6 percent? 67 is what I heard. 67% increase in personal income tax? And 46 on corporate taxes, which of course, let's face it, corporate taxes are paid by consumers anyway, so you get hit with it coming or going. You can compare that with what other states have done, like the neighboring state of Indiana or uh, Wisconsin, Virginia, 
New Jersey, my home state of Utah, which decided to solve their problem simply by reducing their spending. I am told Indiana, Indiana since 2004 reduced its spending by 40 percent. Now, whoa, will, 40 percent, that's a number. And, and it will be interesting to see if the Illinois experience will replicate what happened in Indiana and those other states I listed. And my guess, my gut guess, is it probably will not. Look, when we instituted income tax for the first time in this country, the statute that did that would cap the maximum rate of income tax at 2 percent, even though we only applied a 0.5 percent income tax. I, I think if people would look at their pay checks today, they would see it slightly different than that original time. In as, fact, as I recall, gentlemen, at that time, weren't there people that said that income tax could possibly get as high is 5% and they were laughed off the floor of the Congress that income taxes could get as high as 5%. Am I right in that? It is, it is alarming, but that's actually accurate. And as we found out in that experience, the best tax is obviously something paid by somebody else. It was estimated when that original income tax was in place that 80% of it would actually come from only four states. Apparently four states were fighting it and the rest of the states kind of liked it. Unfortunately, there was, and I'm, I'm not impugning anything here, but a representative from Missouri at the time that actually did say that a new dawn has broken with this new income tax and that actually the government would be more careful with people's money now that we're taking it directly from them than in the past when we simply ran government by taxes coming from tariffs or land sales. We're but, not proud of everybody from Missouri, <laughs> gentlemen. That certainly does not represent your thinking anyway. Oh. But, but what happened is, within a short period of time, using World War I as the excuse, that top rate was not at 2% or at 5 it was 75%. Now, what we found out is the actual amount of money coming into the country was in a decline, not in an incline. So when President Coolidge came into power and initiated the first tax cuts by reducing the rates across the board, the amount of revenue coming into the country actually increased. The same thing happened when President Kennedy tried it, President Reagan, President Bush, because what we found out were people with money were not stupid. They had money for a reason. And that it was not that they were avoiding their taxes. They just found an alternative way of investing. In the case of World War I, it was a lot of municipal funds going in there that were not taxed. Or they simply did not invest their money. They sat on it until such a time as they actually had control of their money again. So. The, the bottom line is here, if we look at the tax pot, pot or proposal as a way of solving our problem, all we do when we allow taxes to increase is allow Congress to actually spend more. It's like going on a diet, which I desperately need. I may change my diet to only eating good food, but if I eat a whole lot more of good food, it's not going to really solve the problem. There's another problem, too that goes on to the spending side is I can actually be full and malnourished at the same time. If I only eat potatoes as a diet, I may be full, but I'm not helping my body. When we look at the spending side, which is really the only option that we have, and we don't look at it in a way of looking at how we are spending, all we're doing is malnourishing us. And all the CRs we passed last year without actually doing a real budget or a real appropriations act, may have flatlined our spending, but it didn't help us out. It was like eating potatoes all the time, which in moderation are good, but if that's the only consumption you have, we're making serious problems. I think and what I'm hearing you say, gentlemen, is, is that America has been getting high on junk food. Is there a, at least you have an a, economic analogy. Is that where you're going? Well, so am I, and I have to admit I love potato chips, but yes, that's where we're going. But what we need to do is I think what this Congress is looking at is to try and readjust what we are doing. Look at our spending levels, which is why 2008 spending will be a starting point to adjust and look at what we are doing. We have to look at our spending in prioritization. So we're not just spending everything. We have to look at what our responsibility of a government is, and we have to look at the spending side seriously. And as the gentleman from Ohio stated, and you stated with your charts, if we do not, if we do not take the spending side seriously as the solution to our problem, we will never find a solution to our problem, and the end result is disastrous for this country. Right. I appreciate your thoughts, and particularly that, uh, uh, that direction that you're taking, because I, my argument would be the problem that we've pointed out with overspending cannot be solved with increasing taxes, and I'd like to talk about that for a minute. And, uh, 
my good friend from Ohio, just hold for a second. I'd like to, to try to illustrate something that when I first came here uh, a couple years back, people talked about the Laffer curve and the idea that you could have the government take more money in by reducing taxes. Now, I'm an engineer by training, and to me that seemed like counterintuitive. How in the world can the government lower tax rates and take in more revenue? It seemed like such an odd thing. And then I started, uh, started puzzling it with my mind a little bit, and I thought, let's say, let's say that someone were to appoint you to be king for a year, but the only thing you can tax is a loaf of bread. And so you start thinking, huh, how do I get the most revenue for my country out of a loaf of bread? Because I'm a political guy and I have to pay the bills of the federal government. So you start thinking, you say, well, I think I'll put a one penny tax on every loaf of bread that people eat. No one will notice the penny and I'll take in a certain amount of money. And then you start scratching your head and say, what if I went the other way? Let's say I taxed a loaf of bread at $10 a loaf. Boy, then I'd get a lot more money in that way. Yeah, but the trouble is nobody would buy any bread. So common sense would say somewhere between a penny and $10, there's some point in there where you're going to get the maximum tax you can get on a loaf of bread, and as soon as you go beyond it, your revenue is actually going to fall off because people will stop buying it, and there just won't be any more bread market going on. And so the point of the matter is, is that there is an optimum level you can tax. When you go beyond it, you stall the economy and, uh, and destroy the federal revenues. Now, that may seem like a theory, but in fact, it's true. It's what happened. I'd like to just run through a couple of charts here. This happened in 2003. In the uh, second quarter of 2003 in May, we passed a big tax decrease in medic in um, capital gains, dividends, and the death tax. What that did was it freed up a lot of money for, for a bill. What you've been talking about is, and there's the people that own businesses. Uh, the death tax ties up a whole lot of money because people, you know, somebody dies and they and just hammer them and put a small business or farm out of business. Uh, and capital gains and dividends, they're all money uh, that was being tied up because of our tax code. So when we reduced those taxes, this is what happened on this black line. I've got three charts here. This black line is when we cut capital gains, dividends, and death taxes. First thing, look at the gross domestic product of our country. You can see it's spotty in here. We're in a recession. The amount of money we're taking in was not good in these early years. Here's what happens when we do the tax cut. You see that there's a jump from 1.1% GDP to 35 So GDP goes up when we cut taxes. So that says, hey, the economy is going. It's doing better. What else happens? Let's take a look at the chart. Same thing. This is May of 2003. This is job losses. Everything below the line is a job loss. We're losing jobs like mad. We get some problems with unemployment. Here's a couple times where we gain some job just for a quarter, but these are by the quarter. We're losing jobs. Then boom, we put this tax cut in place, and look what happens in terms of job creation. We, we created 168,000 jobs, and uh, here we lost 100,000. So first of all, GDP goes up. Job creation goes up, so people go back to work. And here's the key point. Look. Look what happens here to federal revenues. We have cut taxes here, and federal revenues are shooting up. Now, that seems like you're defying the law of gravity. But what's happened was those taxes were stalling our economy. So when you've got a recession, you've got unemployment the way we do, what you've got to do, this would suggest, is you have got to cut taxes give the money back to the people you're talking about, Bill, that own those companies, let them invest, build uh, additional wings on the building, new products, new technology, um, and when that happens, you pull out of the recession and it helps you with your revenues. So the bottom line is, when you take a look coming back to our original question, how do we get out of the problem that we're spending too much money? The answer is, if you start taxing, you're going to drive us further into a recession, making the problem worse. So really, tax increases do not work to fix the problem that we got going here. And I wanted to jump over, uh, Bill, and, and allow you to piggyback some. Bill Johnson from Ohio, a great freshman member. Uh, congratulations to those in the state of Ohio for sending us some good people down here. Bill, please jump in. 
Well, I, you've you've made so many points there. You know, when and I'm a businessman. Uh, after my military career, I founded two small businesses, and before I came to Congress, I was the chief information officer for a for a business, a global manufacturing company, and I sat at the table with our executive leadership team and. And we talked about how do we increase the value to our shareholders, how do we make our company more profitable, how do we uh, put ourselves in a position to be able to, uh, to invest uh, and grow. There's two sides to that formula. On one side, you've got spending. On the other side, you've got revenue. There's a balancing act. Uh, and controlling spending, we've talked about. We've got to stop the out-of-control spending here in Washington, and, and we're going to address that in this Congress. But how do we increase the revenue? That's where you've been talking here for the last few minutes, and you're exactly right. It does not come through tax increases. It comes through letting Americans and businesses keep more of their money because that builds economic buying power. That builds confidence. They invest. They spend. Now, when we did our research on the sales tax holiday uh, uh, back uh, in 2009, what we learned, there were 17 states that had already implemented a sales tax holiday, which validated uh, the concept that you just referred to. Uh, take one state, for example. <coughs> implemented their sales tax holiday uh, in the very first year. Uh, in the month that they implemented that sales tax holiday, they saw an overall. Now, now there were adversaries that said, you can't take that sales tax revenue out of the coffer at a time when we are, are struggling to meet the state budget. Fortunately, sound minds prevailed. They were able to get the bill through. And in the month that they passed that bill and they had that sales tax holiday, their overall sales tax revenues did not decline. They went up nearly 5%. So, so what happened, let me see if I understand this, the sales tax holiday was not a total cutting of all the sales tax, it just reduced it a much lower. That's right, that's right. And by reducing the tax, their revenue increased. Well, what it, what it was, it, it, it eliminated sales tax on certain items, okay. um, like back to school items, things that people had to have to get their kids back in school, um, uh, to put them in college, and those kinds of things. Clothing, school supplies, computers, for example. Many states uh, had a, uh, a sales, included computers in those sales tax holidays. Over the next year, they saw another nearly 5% increase in the sales tax, in the overall sales tax revenues. By the third year, they saw a nearly 8% increase in, uh, in sales tax revenues, and over a three-year period, they were looking at close to 20% overall sales tax revenue increases over that three-year period. By cutting taxes. Because what happened was when people got a tax break on things that they had to have, they would channel those savings into buying things that they wanted to have and that they had been saving up for with their families. And other states started coming across the border to take advantage of that holiday. It's a, it's a, it's a simple concept that we need others to understand. When you let families and businesses keep more of their money and you put the, the decision about how they spend that money in their hands, hmm. America prospers. Well, that's, I really appreciate that's a, a real-life example, something that you worked on uh, looking at different states, and, and uh, it was the same principle that we've seen. Now, you know, uh, the idea of cutting taxes in a recession and cutting federal spending is not new. Uh, JFK understood that principle. He cut taxes when he was president during a recession and put us back on a good economic footing. Ronald Reagan had the biggest tax cut just about in the history of the country till Bush came along, and same thing. And the people made fun of him. It was trickle-down economics and all that kind of stuff. But the fact of the matter was the economy became strong, and he had to have a strong economy to face the threats 
of communism in the Soviet Union. And ultimately, he bankrupted the USSR uh, because of the fact that our economy is strong enough that they couldn't keep up with us in the arms race. And he uh, basically got them to the point that tear down this wall. But it was based on this same principle of the fact that he had tremendously cut the taxes, which allowed the American economy to surge and allow free enterprise and the business men to start making some money. Now, we're doing the exact opposite. We, we've got, at the, at, at the federal level, our income taxes is the second highest income tax in the whole world. That doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Now, I want to, I want to go to this problem a little different angle uh, from it, and uh, that is we've talked about we're spending too much money. We've talked about really that cutting taxes is not the solution. In fact, I mean, raising taxes is not the solution, which means then by definition you've got to cut spending. Well, what are we spending money on? I think that's something we need to take a look at here. And I've got a chart. Before I had the chart that showed, um, it was this chart that shows Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security. And these things people call entitlements because we passed the law a long time ago and it just spits money out, more and more money over time. This chart suggests if you keep your tax at that 18%, that at a certain point, at 2052, these things get so big they squeeze the whole rest of the budget out. The trouble is this chart is optimistic. The problem with the chart is it doesn't include all of the entitlements. There are a lot of entitlements that are not on that chart. But here, take a look at this, at the, uh, what's happened since 1965, and I think this also adds a perspective to what's going on in terms of our spending. In 1965, entitlements were 2.5% of gross domestic product. It starts here, the red line goes up to the point now that in 2010, the entitlements have gone from 2.5 to 9.9%. That's a four times increase to 2010. The trouble is that's just Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security. The additional entitlements would go up even further. This is probably saying that since 65, we've had probably about a five times increase in entitlements. And what's happened in uh, return to national security and defense? The U.S. Constitution says the most basic function for the federal government is to provide for the national defense. It, it uh, may say that we're supposed to promote general welfare, but it's specifically because the only government that we have that can defend our country is the federal government. It is the primary function of the federal government in our preamble to the United States, provide for the national defense. We were spending 7.4% of GDP in 65, which has now dropped down to not quite 5% of GDP. And we have the problem now with the two wars, with all of our equipment aging. And uh, so we're having a whole lot of trouble trying to stay competitive, particularly with China and a lot of their new developments with national defense, because the entitlements are just going nuts. And so the problem is that we're going to have to take a look at entitlements, not just Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid, but there are other ones too. You've got food stamps, you've got uh, public housing, and you also have the debt service. All of this, when you put it together, is using almost all the money that we have coming in in a given year. That says we better get serious about doing some cutting. And uh, once again, um, I'll, I'll come back to you, Congressman Johnson, if you'd like to kind of comment on, uh, on that aspect of, of where we are. Well, you know, you hit the nail on the head again. Uh, national defense uh, is, is our number one priority. It, it has to be. You know, in fact, the oath of office that you and I took on, uh, on uh, January 5th, the same oath of office, virtually the same oath of office that the president takes, it says that we uh, swore or affirmed to support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies foreign and domestic. That, that requirement to provide for the national defense is the number one most important thing that we in the Congress, in the administration, are required to do. Keep America safe, keep America free, protect Americans and American interests around the world. Uh, there is no question that, that we must uh, invest 
uh, in those programs that are going to support our troops in the field. Um, and I agree with you that we must look at, at the proper balance uh, between defense spending and other spending uh, to make sure that we achieve what we have been charged well, good, by good the Air American Force people man, to do. A good Air Force man, I knew you were going to come up with the right answer. That You know, the point of the matter is if you don't have national security, you don't have any other kind of security. You know? Well, and, I, often uh, ask my, uh, I often ask my constituents, you know, what, what is our number one job? You know, what is the president's number one job? Is it to keep us safe or is it to keep us free? And, of course, you get a different number of hands being raised. In my opinion, based on the Constitution, the Declaration of Independence, the president and therefore the Congress's number one responsibility is to keep us free. Because if we are not free, we will never be truly safe. And safety is obviously pretty close on the same level, and, and, they, and they play into one another. But our national defense, flowing down from our national security strategy, our national strategy, that's paramount. I very much appreciate your perspective. We're joined by another great freshman coming from pretty nearby Missouri from the great state of Kansas, Co Congressman Yoder. Uh, it's a treat to have you on the floor, and uh, you've heard we've been pontificating here a little bit about how are we going to deal with this. We know the federal government is spending a whole lot more than what we take in, so we've got to deal with that problem. We've been talking about the fact that taxing isn't a good solution because you raise taxes, you drive your revenues down. It means we're going to have to do some cutting, and uh, so that's a tough subject, but uh, I, I just appreciate the, a little bit of common sense from the great state of Kansas. Congressman Yoder. Well, I appreciate the uh, congressman from Missouri's in indulgence for a little time here. I I've been watching this, uh, this, this uh, conversation you've been having on the floor, the gentleman has, uh, along with the gentleman, uh, and it seems like we're in the middle of an ideological uh, battle in this country. Uh, on one hand, you have folks on the left that argue that government is the solution to all the problems our country is facing. Uh, unemployment, um, their argument is that we need to create more government jobs, that Washington can solve these problems. And out in Kansas, you know, we know that it's the private sector, it's the individual that creates jobs in this country. We know that it's hard work and determination, and you can't substitute that with government bureaucrats or government mandates. You can't mandate uh, or regulate someone into prosperity. It just doesn't happen, and that's a real battle that's happening in this country right now, and I think this is a, a challenge that we've got to really face in this, in this Congress. You know, on one hand, we have more entitlement spending, greater deficits, uh, higher taxes. On the other hand, you've got free enterprise, uh, economic freedom, prosperity, and I, that, to me, that's the real essence of this challenge is are we going to create a, a, a free enterprise country, or are we going to be an entitlement society? And yeah, in, in a way, I think you've really framed things. Uh, I, I appreciate your perspective because you're getting a little bit off at a distance and saying, look, there's two choices, and the two parties really are very, very different in this. You know, one seems to be the party uh, that wants uh, entitlements, uh, they want food stamps, and they have unemployment, and the other party is saying, we want jobs and paychecks. And that's kind of the choice. And um, if you want jobs and paychecks, you've got to have a free enterprise economy. If you want the government to just subsidize you and live off of welfare, that's a different perspective. And so um, what we're seeing is this growth in entitlements. This number is low on this chart because it doesn't have food stamps, it doesn't have public housing, and it doesn't have the debt service. When you put that all together, we're right at the point where the money coming in is just barely paying for all these entitlements and the debt service. You put that together, that's not a good picture. And the solution, I think most Americans, I think that's what the election was about. I bet you that's what your election about was about, was the fact we want, we want to have jobs. And uh, we want to see a strong America. We want to see an America that's free. We want to see a federal government that doesn't enslave us, doesn't tame us, put us in velvet chains of the welfare state, but rather that allows us to, to rise the way Americans have always risen, to the challenges that, that each one of us, the, the dreams we have in our heart, to make those happen, to have a chance to fail or to succeed. And that's what's made America such an incredible place. And uh, I appreciate, uh, Congressman Yoder, you're standing up for, for those basic American principles and values. And, and I think what that means is we're going to have to deal with this level of spending. Uh, Congressman Johnson, back to Ohio. 
You know, I, I wanted to comment on, on what you said and uh, what the gentleman here said about what, what makes America great. The, the, you know, when people stop to consider that this little sapling of a nation in terms of age, I mean, 230 plus years old, virtually, and we're, we're a baby compared to other, uh, many of the other nations in the world, yet every modern convenience, virtually every modern convenience known to mankind was birthed right here in this country. And why was that? It was because of that system of free enterprise based on individual freedom, the ability to pursue our dreams, the ability to innovate that created uh, this free enterprise system that we've come to know. It did not come about in the halls of Congress. It was not discovered in the deliberation rooms of courtrooms. Uh, it was discovered around the campfires and around the dining room tables, the kitchen tables, the fields, the factories. As America came along, we learned when individuals are allowed to pursue their dreams in an environment of freedom without a, an oppressive uh, federal government taxing them into oblivion, Everybody wins. America wins. Our allies win. Everybody wins. You know, it's a, you know, just even hearing you talk about that, somehow that gets me excited. You know, I think about it. God made all these different people, and all of us are different. And um, from the day that you grow up as a little kid, you start thinking about stuff that you'd like to do, whether you want to be a fireman or a doctor or an Indian chief, you know, people kind of talk about that. And you never really know, for most people, they don't really know where their life is going to go, what they're going to achieve or accomplish, but there's something inside human nature that has, a, uh, has this idea, once you start to get the idea that you can dream and do something cool. And uh, so people have these crazy ideas and America was full of these crazy people and all these crazy ideas. They didn't know the ideas were impossible, and they kept trying and trying, and finally the idea becomes maybe vaguely possible, and then pretty soon it actually happens. You take the, the crazy guy that built light bulbs, you know? What did he build, 100, two or 300 light bulbs? And somebody said, boy, you've got to be discouraged, Thomas Edison. He said, no, I've got a couple hundred ways not to make light bulbs, so I'm even closer to the right solution. I mean, you've got to be a little bit, uh, you know, uh, pretty entrepreneurial to have that perspective. And so America, if you think about it, this great country was built one dream at a time by all these people. And one of the great things that Congressman Yoder that you do and Congressman Johnson, is you have a chance to serve your people, what's going to happen? Because uh, you're both freshmen. What you're going to find is, is that through the years, all these people from your district, you'll run into them and you'll see some sort of a little warehouse somewhere and, it, and all of a sudden you realize that that thing is a thundering success. Some guy's dream just, just happened there. And you have, we have a chance to see all these people around us that have, uh, have experienced that American dream. And it is cool, but it doesn't happen by a whole lot of red tape and taxes. Uh, Congressman Yoder, please jump in. Well, I think what the gentleman is speaking about is the American dream. It's the American free enterprise system. Uh, it's the essence of what makes America what it is. And to watch and to see it under threat here in Washington, it angers and it frustrates Americans. And that's what we saw this last year is Americans coming out to town hall meetings and expressing themselves. They don't feel like their voices are being heard on the floor of the United States House of Representatives. They want people to stand up and to, and to explain that greater spending and greater deficits, they're not, that's not the road to prosperity. The road to prosperity is built brick by brick by hardworking Americans uh, out in Kansas and out in Ohio and out in Missouri and all across this country as they work to, to put a little of their own money in and build a business or to, to take care of their family. They work hard. They, they sweat equity. That's what built this country. And when they see the folks in Washington believe that uh, that money isn't, isn't the people's money, it's Washington's money. And in fact, the folks in Washington, they don't even spend the money they're given. They spend as much as they want regardless of how much money we have. And so part of this job situation, this American prosperity situation, it comes back to spending and what we do here on the floor of the United States House of Representatives and how we advocate and stand up for those people that sometimes aren't always heard. That's what we have to do here. 
Well, I'm glad that you're uh, joining us in that. In, in fact, there's a Congressman Jordan from the great state of Ohio who has, uh, I believe, been holding a press conference not, to, not so long ago uh, talking about what are some of the things that we're going to cut because people ask us, you know, what are you going to cut? Well, one of the things is we're going to reduce the non-defense discretionary spending to the 2008 levels. Well, what's that worth? Well, that's a lot of money that you can save that way. And we're going to reduce the, uh, the budget office of every congressman. That was our first week, your first week here. We cut the Congressional Budget Offices by 5%. That just let people know we're serious. Then we read the U.S. Constitution on the floor of the House to say any bill you introduce now has got to be consistent with the Constitution. But we've got another uh, whole series of things that we're going to do to try to reduce spending. Uh, some of them, there, there are $25 billion in un, uh, unused federal property. So what are we going to do with that? Why not sell some real estate? Let's, let's get rid of it. $123 billion is allocated to programs for which government orders can find no evidence of success. The one that I find amusing is the Department of Energy was designed so we wouldn't be dependent on foreign oil. And the department's grown like mad and we're more dependent on foreign oil than we ever were. That needs a good question. Eliminate duplicative programs, among which are, we got... 342 economic development programs. Do we really need 342 of them? 130 programs serving the disabled. 130 programs serving at risk youth. Program, program, program. Do we need that many? Maybe we need a couple of good ones, but certainly we don't need that many of them. So these are all good ones, but certainly we don't need that many of them. So these are all things that are uh, on the table and uh, all things that, uh, that we can, uh, it's just the same chart. Uh, and so the, the, the uh, proposals being made by the study committee has been one, instead of having the graph of, of the discretionary spending going this way, non-defense, they're going to try to flat line that at about uh, 400. So uh, there are a lot of things going on. It's an exciting time. We realize we're going to have to get efficient in government, and we have to um, basically uh, go back to where we started, that the government was to be the servant of the people. It wasn't supposed to be the master. Well, we didn't expect the government to, to pay for everything for us and keep us as, as uh, little dependents. We simply wanted it to get out of the way. We wanted it to defend our right to life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness, and beyond that, to leave us alone. Don't bury us with red tape and government regulations and taxes and um, uncertainties, which we've seen, which have created all the unemployment. I appreciate uh, two great patriots joining me on the floor today, kicking around where we are. I'm very encouraged by our first week or two. First week or two, we started by cutting congressional budgets. Uh, we read the Constitution on the floor. We put together a rule that says every single bill has to be proven to be constitutional or else it doesn't even, doesn't even uh, get out of the hopper. And then, of course, we took a look at one of the biggest jumps in entitlement spending that America could ever take, which was Obamacare. And uh, we voted just yesterday to um, repeal the whole thing. I'll tell you, uh, gentlemen, I know that you were involved back in your own states because you were worried about the fact that if the federal government can't manage Medicare and Medicaid without it breaking the budget, what's going to happen if they take over all of health care? I think what people understand in America intuitively is the fact that if you look at American health care, the front end of it's good. If you get sick, where do you want to get sick? In America, if you have to. The trouble with health care is, is how do we pay for it? That part's broken. So the point isn't to scrap the whole thing and turn it over to the government, which is what Obamacare did. And uh, instead, we're going to fix the things that are broken, but leave the free enterprise part up front, which gives us the best health care in the world. You guys were here voting for that. And uh, for those of us that were fighting that for the last two years, I'll tell you, it felt so good to stick your little credit card in the machine and push that you wanted to repeal it. It was something we were all really looking forward to. And, and you were part of that historic event. And that's just in the first couple of weeks. Uh, I'm looking forward to um, both of you gentlemen uh, in the months ahead uh, really charting that course back to the American dream. You know, I'd, if you'd like to add, I think we're pretty close on time, if you'd like to conclude a couple of comments at either one I'll just uh, I'll just sum up with this because I think you have uh, you have hit the nail on the head we can cure this disease uh, it's called stopping the out-of-control spending and at every opportunity uh, we should seek ways to allow American families and American businesses to keep more of their hard-earned money 
that's going to result in economic confidence, that's going to result in investment, that's going to result in, uh, in increased consumer confidence. We're going to see Americans, uh, and it's going to increase uh, and create jobs, and we know that. Uh, I urge my colleagues, I thank you for this time, and I urge my colleagues to join with me in supporting uh, the legislation and those policies that are going to accomplish those goals. Cutting the spending, letting Americans keep more of their hard-earned money, and ultimately creating jobs and putting America back to work. And I want to thank you for the opportunity today. Boy, that's a, that's a uh, fantastic, straightforward approach to where we have to go. You take a look at it. It's a uh, Unfortunately, the gentleman who was here from Utah before, uh, those of us who are in the over 60 category recognize when it comes to weight, there's two problems. It's either what you eat or how much exercise you get, and you can't really change that very much. The federal budget problem is the same way. It's either how much you're going to spend or how much you can tax, and what's happened is we just can't tax anymore and we're going to have to deal with the spending. And uh, these are some of the items in the proposal that was being made in the press conference today. $80 billion, this is uh, non-security, that means not the defense, discretionary spending. We're going to cut that back to the 2008 level. That's just going back a couple of years to, to knock that back. That saves $80 billion. $45 billion, um, that's the repeal of unspent stimulus funds. That stimulus bill that created all of the unemployment that did not work. Well, we're, there's some of that money still left. We take 45 there, 2. Point, um, almost 3 trillion. That's the non-defense discretionary spending to 2006 levels, and also to eliminate the automatic inflation increases uh, now and for the next 10 years. So that saves a whole lot of money there, 16 billion, and that's return uh, the Medicaid uh, FMAP spending to 2008 levels, and then a 30 billion and the federal control of Freddie and Fannie Mac. That's um, also another area that we've got it. We have not dealt with that. That created the economic crisis we're in. We have not dealt with the cause of the problem. You put this all together, you're at a, about a 2.46 trillion for 10 years, which the result of that uh, comes out at flatlining some of the non-defense discretionary. Does that solve the problem? No, it really doesn't. It helps. But it's still, the bottom line is, we're going to have to deal with those entitlements that are totally out of control. You guys have got a lot on your plates. It's a big job. It's going to be an exciting couple of years. And um, I would uh, I recognize Congressman Yoder if you'd like to make a couple of closing comments. I think we've got about another five minutes or so. Well, I, I, think, I thank the gentleman, and I think what the congressman from Missouri is discussing, these specific points uh, of how we could reduce spending and how we could bring the federal budget uh, back towards a balanced budget, which is what Americans want us to do. Uh, we've all seen across this country, Americans have, what happens in Washington. They spend as much as they want, regardless of how much money they have, and that has to stop. Uh, this is an opportunity this year with a new Congress and new energy and new enthusiasm on behalf of the American people. It's a chance to stand up and say, we're tired of the overspending. We're tired of trillions of dollars being spent on programs uh, for which some of which we can't find real uh, tangible results. We're tired of duplica duplication of programs. We're tired of, uh, of endless bureaucracy and red tape. Uh, Americans want to see action, and they want to see bold proposals such as what you're outlining there uh, to, to show that we can actually truly cut spending. We've heard folks on this floor say we can't cut spending, that it'll hurt too much. Well, what hurts is this $14 trillion debt, this legacy we're living, leaving to our children and our grandchildren. Uh, this, is a, this is an immoral legacy that we're passing along to the next generation. And I think what the gentleman from Ohio is standing up for and the gentleman from Missouri is that this is the time to say enough is enough. It's time to stand up and to start cutting spending and reining in this out-of-control government. You know, the thing that's exciting to me and encouraging to me, uh, it's not just you gentlemen, but the fact that you came here because America was waking up. America is saying it's time to take back America. We're tired of being bullied by our own government, and uh, we're tired of the idea that what you should do is to be paid for not doing something, and that existence in America is sitting around uh, and not having a job. What we want is we want Americans to be able to follow the dreams that are in their heart, you know, and the mentality of the fact that anybody looks like they're having fun, we want to tax them. That just doesn't make any sense at all. And um, sometimes it seems like there, it's such a gloomy perspective to think of America as a country which is 
uh, nothing but the government's going to take care of you. You know, the Soviet Union, years and years ago, they had this basic idea. The government's going to provide you with a home. It's going to provide you with food. It's going to provide you with medical care. It's going to provide you with an education. The government's going to provide you with a job. That was their formula. And it didn't work worth a hoot, and the Soviet Union collapsed. It's in the dustbin of history. And here, what are we doing? We're trying to look at the government to provide you food and a home and an education. The government's going to provide you health care, and the government's going to provide you a job, or if you don't have a job, they'll pay you anyway. That's a formula that didn't work. There's no point in going down that blind alley again. And so what we're coming back to is the thing that's just so exciting about our country. It's a country of exceptionalism. It's a country that's led the world. It's a country that um, is a source of hope for people all around the world as they take a look at our country. And um, it was interesting during the days of Ronald Reagan that he got a message out of the, uh, some of the concentration camps up in Siberia and Gulag and uh, different places that were really rough. And um, the people were thirsty for news of what was happening with America, and they were praying for us because they realized that we were a source of hope and inspiration to the rest of the world. There was um, a group of our founders came over on a boat. It was called the Lion. It was uh, 1630. It was some of the Puritans under uh, Winthrop. And uh, they wrote something called the Model of Christian Charity. It was a long sort of Puritan-type document, but it said something about we must consider that we should be a city on a hill, a light to the people around the world. And that was where Reagan picked that up in his speeches. Of course, it came out of the Bible, that we should be a city on a hill, a light to the people of the world, a good example, and uh, an inspiration so that they would uh, think of also being free from the influence of excessive government. And um, so that's the challenge that you as freshmen, that all of us, all of Americans are facing. And I think people are starting to understand this is going to mean some changes. It's going to be changes in our behavioral pattern and the fact we've just got to start cutting back on government and we just can't continue to let the thing run the way we have. The uh, bottom line is we get back to it. I want to restate the problem. And the problem is this, that when you put those entitlement programs with the debt service together, we are spending almost the same amount of money as what we take in in revenue, and that's not a penny for defense or discretionary spending at all. That's where we are. That's pretty sobering. Um, and uh, so that's, that's why the challenge is significant. We're not going to get there overnight. We're not going to be able to balance the budget in one year. Um, I don't even think the most conservative guy in Congress says, would think that we could do that. There's any probability that America could adjust that rapidly. But we can balance a budget, and we must. The fact is we have to take steady steps, one at a time, and move forward with this because of the fact that we're protecting that most precious idea that America has been, that, that hope and that bright light on a hill for people all around the world. The, um, the aspect of America and the American dream, there's something that I talked about sometimes when um, I was... Uh, doing some campaigning, and I, I like to, to throw into the mix there the concept that in following the dream that's in your heart, it takes a certain amount of courage. Those people like Thomas Edison, the people that came by the Statue of Liberty with a shirt on their back and a little change in their pocket, that took guts to do that. It's going to take guts to go where we have to go, but with courage and with God's blessing, we can do it, gentlemen. And uh, Mr. Speaker, thank you so much for your indulgence, and uh, God bless you all. Under the Speaker's announced policy of January 5, 2011, the Chair recognizes the gentleman from Iowa, Mr. King, for 30 minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate the honor to be recognized here on the floor of the House of Representatives. And listening to my colleagues in the previous hour has been uh, very interesting to me and I think informative to the American people at the same time. Um, we're here now today, the first day after the House has voted to repeal Obamacare. And I noted yesterday, although not into this congressional record, Mr. Speaker, that yesterday, the day of the, the big vote that came up that did the, pass the repeal of Obamacare here in the House, was the one-year anniversary of the election of Scott Brown 
from uh, Massachusetts to the United States Senate. And I'd like to take you back, if I could, Mr. Speaker, to that time. Uh, where we were a year ago today, 13, 14, 15 months ago, in fact, I'd like to dial us all the way back to, let's say, the beginning of August of 2009. Now, that was the time that the town hall meetings lit up all across this country. And as we, as we watched the intensity of the issue of the health care policy unfolded before us here in the House of Representatives, the national debate, the media debate, the talk in the coffee shops and across the backyard fences in our churches and in our daily lives, was focusing on health insurance and health care policy in America. And I would remind uh, Mr. Speaker and those listening into this conversation we are having that the President of the United States had consistently said that we were in an economic downward spiral. We're in a bad economic fix. If you remember uh, Henry Paulson coming to this Capitol on uh, September 19th of uh, 2008, and uh, telling us that he needed $700 billion right now without any strings attached to solve what he predicted could likely be the collapse of credit and currency globally. And this Congress, over my objections, most vociferous and votes, did send that money to Henry Paulson, and some of it got spent the way he intended to. But this, uh, the, the fear of this economy brought about, to some degree, an increase in the number of Democrat seats in the House of Representatives, and it contributed to the election of Barack Obama as president. And he has said that he had inherited some of the worst economic times ever. And the President of the United States told this country over and over again, we're in an economic problem and a downward spiral. And he said we couldn't, first, we couldn't fix the economy unless we first fixed health care in America. So he made that an issue that went into the middle of the, of the economic calamity conditions that we had. I didn't accept that analysis. But he also said that the problem with health care was we spend too much money in relation to other countries in the world, in relation to the overall size of our economy, in relation to the individual dollars that are spent on individual patients. And there's some degree of truth to that. In fact, I think a significant degree, but in areas that the president didn't want to address. And so he said we have to fix our economy, and we can't fix it unless we first fix the problem with health care. That includes when they use that term. That means health insurance and health care altogether. They've conflated those two terms. And so his solution for spending too much money on health care was spend a lot more money on health care. And now we have an Obamacare piece of legislation that has been pushed through this House. We had to vote to repeal yesterday that spends a lot more money. And Mr. Speaker, you don't solve the problem of spending too much money by spending a lot more money. That would be uh, the health care equivalent of Keynesian economics, wouldn't it, Mr. Speaker? Keynesian economics being that philosophy of John Maynard Keynes, who was uh, an economist and um, a very influential one in that period of time that uh, when uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt was elected uh, to our President of the United States, and a similar economic time of downward spiral. And their belief was that you could borrow money and send that money out into the public and get people to spend that money. And if you do that, it would stimulate the economy. In fact, John Maynard Keynes, um, perhaps facetiously, in fact, I believe it was facetiously, but I think it's worthy to tell the story that he told. He said, I can solve the economic problems here in the United States. He said, I can solve all the unemployment in America by doing this. Go out to an abandoned coal mine drill a whole bunch of holes out into that abandoned coal mine, fill those holes up full of cash, U.S. greenbacks, and then fill the abandoned coal mine full of garbage. Now think of that image, Mr. Speaker. An abandoned coal mine with holes drilled in a, in a random pattern all across the face of the abandoned coal mine, deep holes, shallow holes, big holes, small holes, fill them full of cash, and then backfill the holes, fill the abandoned coal mine up with garbage, and then he said, turn the entrepreneurs loose. The entrepreneurs will go in. Now I have to fill in the blanks because that's the only part of the quote that I know. And um, the entrepreneurs would then go in and start to dig the garbage out, haul the garbage out to make way to dig into the holes to come up and pull out the cash. And somebody has to support the industry of the 
people that are hauling the garbage out and digging back down into the holes, and somebody has to exchange the cash, the garbage covered cash, for clean cash. There's all, it's like an industry that would begin in a similar way that a, a gold mining town might begin if somebody discovers gold in Colorado or California or maybe even Iowa one day. But the idea was if you could get money into people's hands, they would spend it, and it will create multiple iterations of, a, of a economic activity. And Maynard, John Maynard Keynes believed that would stimulate the economy. The president believes this also, our current president, Mr. Speaker. He told us that on um, February 10th, 2009, when he spoke to the Republican conference, and he said that Franklin Delano Roosevelt's New Deal actually did work that it was working, but in the second half of the 30s, President Roosevelt lost his nerve. He got too concerned about spending too much money, and he pulled back. And in pulling back, that brought about, according to our current president, a recession within a depression. And unemployment numbers went up in the second half of the 30s because they should have borrowed and given away and spent more money at the federal government level. And I, he convinced me on that day that this president would not make that mistake. And we're walking, talking, Mr. Speaker, all within the, the uh, confines of Keynesian economics, which I want to make it very clear, I completely disagree with that philosophy. The president does not, and he did not, by his view, make the mistake that FDR did. He has continued to push for more borrowing and more spending and a growth in the debt and the deficit, and we continue to see unemployment numbers that push at double digits, 98%, or excuse me, 9.8%, then down to 9.4%, and it looks like that may be a permanent condition until we can get free enterprise to kick back in again. But this is the approach economically. The president sees this in a downward spiral when he takes the oath of office and goes out and pushes to spend more and more and more money. And yes, Mr. Speaker, there will be those who are, are sitting at home or perhaps in the gallery who are thinking, but some of this started under George W. Bush's presidency. And it did, Mr. Speaker. But it was all supported by Barack Obama, and it was significantly accelerated on the other after the election and the inauguration of, of uh, Barack Obama. <clears throat> and so his approach to solving the economic problem was borrow more money, spend more money, drive this nation into debt, and believing that he could stimulate an economy that somehow would come back and pay the taxes to offset the interest and the, and the overhead that this government now has. That's the Keynesian approach. Well, he used the same pro approach when it comes to health care, the Keynesian approach to health care, which is this thought. We spend too much money on health care. We can't afford it. We have too many people uninsured. So let's go out here and impose a health insurance policy on another 32 or 47 million Americans and send the IRS in to enforce the law so that they compel every American to buy a health insurance policy that is either produced or approved by the federal government. Remember, the president wanted the public option. The president is on record in previous years of being for a complete takeover of the health insurance industry, and, and which implies the complete takeover of the health care industry in America. They had the debate during the nomination process between Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton. Hillary Clinton carried the best credentials of her proposals on health care into that campaign. Barack Obama had to offset her strong liberal health care credentials with some of his own. That's what ginned this up. This is what convinced America that we were in a health care crisis. And the president grabbed it and went into the arena of an economic crisis using the Rahm Emanuel philosophy, which is never let a crisis go to waste, and sought to bring about the beginnings of socialized medicine here in the United States. That's the foundation and the backdrop for what we have. And that brought about town hall meetings in August of 2007 and early September, I would add, that were jam-packed all across this country. My town hall meetings have never been so full. I had some that were standing room only. Uh, Senator Grassley, in the same area that I represent, had to take one of his meetings outdoors because there wasn't room for people inside the huge building that they had set aside for the town hall meeting. That's just a part of Iowa, but that's a, that's a snapshot of the broader picture of the entire United States. There was intensity. We saw it. We saw it in YouTube. We saw it on the news. We saw Senator Specter, I'll say, getting a message delivered to him utterly clearly 
in his town hall meetings. We saw members of Congress that were, to some degree, disrespected in their town hall meetings, which I regret. We also saw many, many members of this House and the Senate that did jam-packed town hall meetings and listened to constituents for hours on end and did uh, tele-town halls on the phone so those that couldn't or didn't come out had an opportunity to weigh in. We read the mail, we took the phone calls, we took the emails, the snail mail, all the messages that we could. And wherever I went, the subject of health care was brought to me starting intensively in August of 2009, carrying through in the, um, throughout the fall of 2009. And as the subject came to this floor and was voted on on November 7th of 2009, that was a Saturday night, when this House passed the, the House version of Obamacare over the strongest of objections. The 5th of November 2009, tens of thousands of people poured into this capital city, Mr. Speaker, to peacefully petition the government for redress of grievances in a very constitutional fashion. They were out there in red, white, and blue, all the colors of the rainbow, so to speak, making their own signs. They were here on their own dime. They came from every single state. And we know they came from every single state. I've talked to people from most of those states. And the states that had a gap, for example, I didn't talk to anybody from Hawaii. Well, why do I say they come from every state? I met people from Alaska. Uh, people from Hawaii went to Michelle Bachman's office as she was out uh, working against the Obamacare bill and presented and laid on her desk a lay that they brought from, from Hawaii. They came from every state to, to peacefully petition the government for redress of grievances exactly in a constitutional fashion. 5th of November 2009 on a Thursday, we did a huge press conference out on the west lawn of the Capitol with numbers of people that ranged in the 30 to 40,000 30 to 40,000 people small side up to perhaps 50 to 60,000 people outside calling for this congress to listen to them to keep this congress's hands off of their health care well it still their hearts were hardened and they had we had a, another press conference the following saturday just 3 days later that had thousands of people at it and and still on that saturday night they brought a vote to the floor that moved the Obamacare legislation out of the House of Representatives down the hallway all the way through the end of the Capitol into the United States Senate. That was November 7th, the Saturday night of 2009. And the Senate took it up and they were looking for a way to, well, I'll say the Majority Leader Harry Reid and others were looking for a way to pass Obamacare in the Senate. And as the maneuvering unfolded, it came to Christmas Eve, Mr. Speaker. On Christmas Eve, most of the procedural maneuvers that the Republicans had in the Senate were exhausted. Christmas Eve day. They had 12 more hours that they could have used to delay the vote and 12 more hours of, of a debate that could have been extended. But they decided to shake hands with Harry Reid and allow it to come to a vote, Obamacare to come to a vote, on December 24th about 9 a.m. Well, that let everybody get a plane ticket to go home. I wanted them to use every single minute to delay it as long as they possibly could until 9 o'clock on Christmas Eve night, in which we know there aren't planes flying out of this town anymore after that. I would have, been, I would have thought that if anybody wanted to impose that version of socialized medicine on the American people, if they, wanted, they believed in it that strongly that they had to do it on Christmas Eve morning, they could have just as well done it Christmas Eve night at 9 o'clock and spent their Christmas here in Washington, D.C. after they put that great big lump of coal in our stocking, the stocking of the American people. And so when I saw that, I, 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 that was a tactic that energized me more. And I asked one of the well-established and uh, very respected Republican senators, what do we do now? What do we do now? Where's our next line of defense? We had 12 more hours we could have fought this. His answer was, pray and pray for a victory in the special election in Massachusetts. That was my email back on the morning of December 24th from that exchange. And I thought, I don't think I have the audacity to pray for an intervention in a Senate election in Massachusetts. How could there possibly be a Republican victory 
in Massachusetts. We know the politics of Massachusetts, and it's 100% Democrats and was in uh, each of their eight congressional seats and in their two Senate seats, and had been for a long time. And so I thought about that and deliberated on it, and I thought that's the only real choice that I have. And I, I found myself in Massachusetts the last three days of the Scott Brown election. And I found a lot of patriots in Massachusetts, residents of Massachusetts, uh, Tea Party groups, constitutional conservatives, 912 Project people, independents that are constitutionalists with the cause, discerning Democrats that have come over from the other side. I met a couple that had always walked the streets for Democrats, a union couple, both the husband and the wife. And they told me that they were done, that they were working for the Republican side, and they would always stay on the Republican side. I met people there with the deepest amount of patriotism and went to look at Plymouth Rock and there, and of course, Boston Harbor was the, the, uh, the real Boston Tea Party. And why would I have thought that the state that could launch the revolution and have an actual real Tea Party, why would I have thought that the Bay State couldn't deliver us a measure of defense and relief from Obamacare? And so yesterday, I have to do the fast forward point now, Mr. Speaker. But yesterday here on the floor of the House of Representatives was the one-year anniversary from the election of Scott Brown. And I don't think anybody said it into the record, but this Congress, having gone through all of that and seen 87 freshman Republicans elected, the majority turn over, and the American people rise up and send their message in the fashion that was imagined by the Founding Fathers themselves that this would be the quick reaction body here in the House of Representatives voted on the anniversary of the election of Scott Brown, which we thought saved us from Obamacare and ultimately did not, but voted to repeal Obamacare lock, stock, and barrel so with no less vestige of it left behind to remove that malignant tumor before it could metastasize and, and consume the liberty of the American people. Now, that vote yesterday on repeal and I mentioned into, um, to my family and some people around that I should have been euphoric. I should have been ready to dance a jig. And truthfully, it was satisfying. It was pleasing. I had a, had a good feeling about what we had accomplished. But it's maybe similar to um, climbing a mountain. And when you get up there into the altitude and you've reached a place along the way to the summit, and the altitude gets a little thin, and the effort to get to that point uh, is so great. Yet that effort, that energy that it drains off, also drains off some of the euphoria. And if you look up at the balance of that peak and you see you've got to scale some, uh, some pretty steep cliffs to get there, and even though you can see the path and you know you've got the ability to do it, you don't feel that euphoria uh, when, as you go up in the same way you might as you imagine the climb in the first place. And that's where it was here yesterday. You didn't, hear a, you didn't hear a noise come up out of the Republicans on this side. Uh, we're respectful of people on the other side of the aisle. We have a legitimate disagreement and a difference of opinion. But the American people have spoken. They've filled up this side of the aisle. And every Republican, that every freshman that I know of, ran on the repeal of Obamacare. It was a big vote for them yesterday. And it's keeping faith with the American people. But the better way to describe this vote yesterday to repeal Obamacare, I think, was described by Winston Churchill <clears throat> at the beginning of the Battle of Britain. And I think this was actually, and I should have checked the history book, um, but, but it was in the early part of the, of the World War II. When well, Winston Churchill, in speaking to brace up the British people in uh, war against the Nazis, said this, Now this is not the end. It is not even the beginning of the end. It is, perhaps, the end of the beginning. I think that's where we are in the repeal of Obamacare, Mr. Speaker. It is perhaps the end of the beginning that we accomplished yesterday, and now we have a long, hard slog to quote a previous Secretary of Defense, whom I greatly respect, and um, that long, hard slog amounts to this. The resolution that passed today directs the committees to begin the project of, of writing replacement language, shaping bills and legislation for replacement language so that we can apply 
free market ideals, constitutional ideals, protect the doctor-patient relationship so that we can address the abuse of lawsuits that is driving up the cost of health care, both in two forms, the cost of the litigation and the money that goes to the trial lawyers, as well as the cost of the defensive medicine and unnecessary tests so that doctors uh, try to avoid and, and minimize the um, potentials for lawsuits. That, uh, actually, there's a hearing going on in the Judiciary Committee that I left to come over here to deliver this um, message, Mr. Speaker. We'll do all of those things, and the work has started here in the House. And on top of that, though, we must, as the appropriations process unfolds, we must unfund Obamacare. It's a constitutional method to put a stop to the development of, of uh, authorized legislation. It would freeze in place the development of Obamacare until such time as we can complete the repeal. And so, Mr. Speaker, I am for and will work to put language in every appropriations bill that prohibits the use of those funds for the purposes of implementing or enforcing Obamacare. And to do that on every appropriations bill, especially the bill that will come through here before the end of February, or near the end of February, that is necessary to keep our government functioning beyond the expiration of the continuing resolution, which is March 4th, uh, coming up in a, in a month and a half or a little better. We put language in that continuing resolution that we likely will have to extend this funding. And it doesn't have to be for the duration of the fiscal year. If it's for a month or two months or the balance of the fiscal year until September 30th, that's fine. But every appropriations bill must have the language in it that shuts off the implementation or the enforcement of Obamacare and prohibits any funds that were heretofore appropriated from being used for the same. That's the language that we need in each appropriations bill. And if we do this, then the President of the United States will at a certain point need to sign an appropriations bill to keep the government funding. He'll have to agree with the people of America and the voice of the House of Representatives. And what I also think that he has to agree with what I believe is the majority in the United States Senate, Mr. Speaker. The uh, majority leader in the Senate said the bill is not coming up. The repeal of Obamacare bill is not coming up in the Senate, that he will block it, that he won't bring it up. I think his job is to bring out the will of the Senate, to reflect the will of the Senate, because the people in the Senate are the representatives of the people of the United States of America. And every senator over there would agree with me in this. Their constituents deserve every bit as much representation as Harry Reid's constituents do. And when one senator holds the rest of the, the chamber up for, the, for his own personal will, for his own political agenda, and doesn't allow the will of the Senate to be reflected, uh, that happens in certain leverage positions over in the Senate. And the nuances of that are not something that I want to comment on. I just comment on this uh, tonight, Mr. Speaker, that I will challenge the, the majority leader in the, senator, in, in the Senate this. Put the repeal of Obamacare up on the floor of the Senate for a vote. Give the American people a vote in the United States Senate. Let them hear where every one of the 100 senators are. Put them on record. If they like Obamacare so much, vote against the repeal. If you stand where I do, vote to repeal it. And I predict that the majority votes are in the Senate today to pass the repeal of Obamacare. And Mr. Speaker, I believe that the American people will put their request over to the United States Senate over and over and over again until that very hot potato, a very large hot potato, gets larger and hotter as it sits in the lap of the Majority Leader, leader Harry Reid until such time as the American people get a vote in the United States Senate. And yes, I recognize that the President would veto such legislation. But we would then know, we already know where every member in the House of Representatives stands, we would then know where every member in the United States Senate stands, and we would be able to see how much resolve the President has to protect his signature legislation and whether he cares more about his signature piece of legislation that the American people have rejected than he does about the government of the United States and the broader well-being of the people and the security even of the United States, the functions of government. Um, so I'll go back again, Mr. Speaker, and say and reiterate the strategy now is this, that this is not the end 
of our efforts to repeal Obamacare. It is not even the beginning of the end of our efforts, and it's not the beginning of the end of Obamacare, but it is perhaps the end of the beginning. We launched this off yesterday and the day before. We had the vote that went up last night. Now we know that Republicans stand unified 100% in opposition to Obamacare, and anybody that will vote to repeal Obamacare also should be on good solid ground to vote to block any funding that would implement or enforce Obamacare. And that's the stand we need to take in every appropriations bill while the authorization committees work on the replacement policies as is reflected by the resolution that passed here in the House of Representatives today. Um, we have a large task in front of us. I am not daunted by the difficulty of it. I realize it will take a lot of energy and a lot of effort and commitment over the next couple of years to finally accomplish the end of Obamacare as we, Mr. Speaker, elect a president in 2012 whom I hope and trust and believe will run on the ticket of plank number one in his platform, sign the repeal of Obamacare. And I look forward to that day, Mr. Speaker, when we see the effect of the resistance uh, to the will of the people in the United States Senate. I believe that will put more Obamacare opponents in the United States Senate during the 2012 election. I believe it will strengthen the ranks of Obamacare opponents here in the House of Representatives in the 2012 election. And I think that it will also elect a president of the United States who will be taking the oath of office on the west portico of the Capitol January 20th in 2013. And Mr. Speaker, here's the image I have in mind. First, earlier in January of 2013, the House will have to repass the final repeal of Obamacare. And the Senate then, I believe, will take it up and pass that repeal of Obamacare and send it where, message it where? I hope we message it out to the podium on the west portico of the Capitol for January 20th, 2013, where I hope to be in a good vantage point where I can see the next President of the United States, and I ask him, take the oath of office with pen in hand, and take the oath this way, Mr. Speaker. I do solemnly swear to the best of my ability to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States, so help me God. And before that new president shakes hands with the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, I'd like to see him take his hand down with pen in it and sign the repeal of Obamacare right there on the, at, during the, the swearing-in ceremonies of the next president of the United States to set the tone for the new era that we'll be working towards throughout 2011 and 2012. So when the sun comes up in the morning of January 21st, 2013, we'll be free at last from the burden of socialized medicine and the freest people in the world will have rejected dependency and will have stood up for independence and stood up for the vitality of the American people. That, Mr. Speaker, is the vision I have in mind, and I'll work on that every day until that's accomplished. That's my pledge to you, Mr. Speaker, and the American people. It's my privilege to address you here on the floor, and I thank you and yield back the balance of my time. Uh, the gentleman yields. Under the Speaker's announced policy,